Praise the Lord. Does anyone remember the, the series that we're in the middle of for Sunday school? The building principles for building family, happy, happy home. That's all right. You got a lot closer today than you did last week. We're only in lesson four, so it's okay. We're getting there. Um, we're going to do a quick review, just to summarize what we talked about last week. But before we do that, lesson six, excuse me, I got confused when my screen went blank on me. Principle six is the gift of giving. Principle seven is a trusting heart. In this lesson, building a happy home continues through the application of principles such as giving and trusting. Giving creates a cycle of blessing that rests over your home, and trusting opens our hearts to love. Now, I do want to go over a re recap. Last week we talked about love. We talked about how you choose your love and then you love your choice. Our homes need the influence of the love of God. It needs to be lived, not simply spoken. Love that is lived is the only kind that transforms. Love makes families last, and it brings with it a guarantee that your home will be a place of safety. And then the next principle we talked about was testimony. We all have our past victories to remind ourselves of the power and faithfulness of God. We, we can all speak the word of testimony that can feed our faith at the table of yesterday's victory. There needs to be a consistent teaching and a proclaiming of testimony to accompany convictions. Let our lives and our actions testify of God's grace and clearly state our commitment to endure in spite of the circumstances. Make testimonies a readily part of your home. You okay, sweetheart? Yeah. Don't say brother. I'm here for you, okay? Don't say brother. We love you. Moving on to principle six, the gift of giving. The process of giving is so powerful that it not only affects the giver, but also the neutral observer. There's a talk about happy givers. The healthiest of bodies of water are those of, that have life flowing in and flowing out. If you remember, go back to our first lesson of Fate of Satan, we talked about the, the difference between the Dead Sea and the Bering Sea. The Dead Sea is a dead sea because it only has water coming in and it has no outlet. And therefore, life cannot sustain itself. But the rivers that have water coming in and then water going back out, that's where life is. And such is life with giving. If you just receive, you'll grow cold. If you want to be happy, find a need and fill it. No matter how big or small, giving something to someone will bring happiness. Our Christian walk should have the gift of giving in it. Frustration comes when we focus on what we do not have. However, happiness can be found in focusing on what others need. In other words, you give to be happy and be happy giving. I'm going to take a little uh, pause from here. Personal testimony. I know someone in, in my life and I've told them before, they are the most selfish person that I know. Uh, they've given up a relationship with their kid because they had ad admirations and they had goals they wanted to be an actor. That, that was what they wanted to do in their life, and a kid just got in the way. So they <coughs> did not. He said that if he had stayed with his son, that he would have learned, he would have grown to resent his son because he couldn't have done what he needed to do with his son. And he justified that. But to me, that's, that's a very selfish mindset. And, it, and it's not just that one decision, his entire lifestyle. But today, he very much still suffers from depression and is constantly sad and constantly looking for the next big thing. If all you're doing is trying to make yourself happy, You'll be miserable. We're not built that way. We are not made that way. 
We are made to be conduits of God's love. And a conduit that only receives is a clogged conduit. And it needs to be replaced. Life without giving. There was, there's an article titled Seven Habits of Highly Unhappy People by Tamara Starr. It gives insights into a life that focuses primarily on self. These are characteristics of a life that is not focused on giving. It has an overall negative view of life. They have an extreme difficulty trusting anyone. You only see the wrong and not the right in every area of life. Comparison comes naturally and makes way for jealousy. Needs to control all things. Looking at the future only brings fear and worry. Gossip and complaining is the norm. <clears throat> Going back to that slide again, the healthiest bodies of water are those that have life flowing in and flowing out. There are These are things that, that we talk about that they bring unhappiness. If we want our lives and homes to be happy, we must turn the focus from self to God and others. Not that we ignore ourselves and the legitimate needs that we have as human beings, but that our primary why in life is God and those around us. The healthiest bodies of water are those that have flowing life in and flowing out. There must be both. Almost snuck in a little bit. Yeah. You hadn't been so loud sitting down. That's the cry. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. We're talking about being uh, punctual for church and, and the necessity for being on time. <laughs> I forget I'm being recorded. <laughs> I gotta be nice. Now, uh, when we're talking about giving, yes, we're gonna talk about tithing and God's promises for tithers. There are promises that He makes. Even though giving encompasses all areas of life, tithing is still a vital thing for a child of God. He loves a cheerful giver. Boy, I remember, uh, what's the old joke? The dad wanted to teach his son a lesson, so he gave him a dollar and gave him a nickel and said, I want you to choose one of these to give for an offering. And the son came back with a dollar. He said, why didn't you give him the nickel? He said, God loves a cheerful giver. A whole lot more cheerful giving him the nickel and keeping the dollar. <laughs> he loves a cheerful giver. Every man, according as he, has purpose, as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver, 1 Corinthians 9 and 7. I want God to be able to do his will in my life that requires tithing. I want God to be able to do his will in my life that requires, I want him to be able to do it. I, I would hate to know that the reason why he is not able to do his will in his life is because I'm holding back. That's what the author is trying to say there. Someone with a generous spirit will be happier longer. Oh, that's, I didn't pay notes there. Hot, can I take my glasses off? Because the uh, comment came back to me that when I read with my glasses, all they see is glare. So I, I'm, I'm at the age where I can't read so well without my glasses. I need to start studying more so I can have this memorized and I don't need to read as much. But in life, there are givers and there are takers. Takers are only happy for a fraction of the moment that they are taking, whereas someone with a generous spirit will be happier longer. As long as your hands are open, God can take what he wants to take and put in your hands what you need to have. Now, that's a good analogy. As long as your hands are open, he can do what he needs to with it. Now, God is God, and he can force anything he wants, but he's not going to force anything. He's not going to rip it from your hands. And he's not going to shove something on your hand. He'll let you live your life to your own demise. Do not look for loopholes in giving because you can't outgive God. It's not about, it's not a, a return of investment, so to speak. Okay, You cannot go, go to your stockbroker and say, look, I gave this much time, I gave this much back. It's 
I like that. But there is there are promises. Last week we talked about when God speaks in the Word of God. Now it's true. So there's scriptures. Malachi three and ten says, "I will give you a blessing that spills over." I mean, there's not enough room to receive. That's that's the Word of God. Now again, he says, "I will protect your harvest. I will bring the fruit of your hard work to completion. I will establish your reputation." I will establish your climate. Climate is the median temperature or weather of a location. When God establishes your climate, you will still have ups and downs, but your climate will be an overall pleasant one. Ain't that something? That's a promise from the book of Malachi. For the time. If you will look outside of yourself and serve God and others with a giving spirit, you will see results. Amen? those on the beta treatment and I called them about it. And now here I am with some just for that, changing it to the next president. <laughs> A trusting heart, Skyler. <laughs> We're all human. <laughs> I would rather be naive and proven wrong than be suspicious and proven right. Now, that's hard. I would rather be naive and proven wrong than be suspicious and proven right. I want you to chew on that for a second because that goes against... I've had this argument with someone near and dear in my life that I've been with for a long time. I'm not going to name names. It's okay to be wrong in the name of trusting someone. Especially in ministry. Especially in ministry. I believe in raising kids. I believe it's better that my kids know I trust them than it is for me to be right every single time. I'll let them think they get one over on me if I can get one little step closer and let them know that I trust them. But some parents believe the opposite. Thou shalt not win. Thou art not smarter than me. I shall smite thee with my brilliance and my experience. There's too much pride and um, protection there. It, it takes a humility to be willing to let yourself be vulnerable and say, it's all right, I trust you. You may make me look stupid, but I'm willing to trust you. As a church, that can take us a whole lot further in reaching people. That takes us a whole lot further in making, building relationships. Yeah, we, we'll be proven wrong. We'll be disappointed. But the relationships we do build from it will be stronger because of it. When our desire, when our desire is for our home to be happy and not a place of negativity, the principle of trust is an important one. Trust connects to a principle already discussed. We talked about the treasury of testimony. By activating the word of a testimony in your home, it cultivates an environment for trust to increase and doubt to leave, thus reducing negativity. So talking about the good things of God, we talked about earlier, it naturally speaks positive and it, it builds an atmosphere of trust. So you, you tend to believe people when we speak positive things. I went somewhere completely different than where the author did there, but it's okay. A happy home reaches for trust even when the circumstances are full of doubt. If my kid gets kicked, get, one of my children got kicked off the bus for having a knife. I'm not going to say that. It's not important. There's a million reasons why that child could have had a knife on the bus. I chose to believe the child and their justification, even though it was not a good justification. Because in the end, it didn't matter. They were still kicked off the bus for a little bit. They're going to suffer for it. <coughs> but I wanted to 
doesn't know. Okay. I'll get you. For example, uh, on another subject, bullying. I told all my kids to give the teacher one shot. And let me know how your pastor feels about this. If you disagree with me, pray for me. They're to give the school one shot. One shot only. And then they give their fist a shot. If, if it comes down to they, they feel it's worth it. However, I tell them that they must suffer whatever the school's consequence is. Scholars on the softball team, you may get kicked off the softball team. Daniels in band, you may get kicked out of band. Elijah's in football, you may get kicked out of football. If that's worth it to you, I'm going to believe you because I trust your character. I know my kids are not bullies. They're not out there looking for a fight. So if they feel the need to draw back and connect their knuckles to someone's nose, and obviously there was a good enough reason, and I choose to trust them. I don't need them to spend an hour convincing me it was worth it. Just as long as you know you're going to, I'm not here to fight for your innocence. You won't get, you'll get suspended, but you, when you come home, I'm not going to punish you twice when you get home, because you've already paid your price. But I bring that up to say that trust that I give my kids. I trust their character. I trust their judgment. Does that open me up for ridicule? Does, does that open me up for them to take advantage of it? Yep. But I feel they've earned that trust. Skylar, I don't have my glasses on. I can still see your smile. That's scary. I don't want to look at that green one. Like that. I, I believe in trusting no matter, no matter how dull and full of doubt the circumstances are. I believe in trusting each other. Not so much where you're stupid, okay? If the kid's got a needle hanging out of his arm and he says he promised he's sober, okay, I'm not talking about that kind of circumstance. I think I've made myself clear in what I'm talking about here. Don't be willing to fight just so you don't be wrong. Show them that you're willing to trust them. And, and that's with people as a whole. It'll get you further. It'll get people in the, in the door. It'll get people to talk to you at work where, where they can trust you with their prayer requests and we can be ministers and we can reach folks. But if we're always trying to call them out, they, they don't need another persecutor. Going back to trust, talking about trusting God. God has never failed anyone and he won't start with you. Now, there are some enemies of trust. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart, and such trust have we through Christ to God. That's 2 Corinthians 3, 3 through 4. Applying the principle of trust begins with the knowledge that every promise, law, mandate, and principle from the Bible comes from God. Everything in the Bible comes from God, whether we understand it or not. The Bible says that the husband is the head of the household. Whether we misteach it, whether we misapply it, the Bible says it. So we start there. Now we need to study it because it says the husband loves your wives. All right, so he's not talking about a, an abusive dictatorship, but there is an accountability structure. I mean, keep going back to my kids, but one of the first things I had to teach Skylar was to trust me. She didn't understand my, my decisions, and I say her because she's the oldest. She, she didn't understand it, and that makes sense because a, a young person's mind, they don't, they haven't seen everything. They, they, they can't see past the noses on their face. They don't know what, what the possibilities are, and just, they just don't understand. That's fine. I'm glad I understand that you don't understand, but I see things differently. And what I told her was, I said, do you trust me? Am I here to ruin your life? Do you think I get my jollies off by making you angry? No. Everything I do, I believe, I really believe is for your betterment. So if you don't understand it, can you at least fall back on the trust? And I believe she has, for the most part, at least in, in my face. God knows what she does behind my back. She may have voodoo dolls in her bedroom for all I know. But, so 
the same thing with God. If we understand that every law and promise and principle comes from God, and we trust God, it'll make us, it'll make things easier to obey. Therefore, if the enemy of our souls can convince us to doubt this fact, trust is nearly impossible. Boy, if he can convince us that that's not the word of God, or if God didn't say that, or when we doubt God's word and his love, fear quickly finds a foothold. The connection between trust and the testimony has been established. If we understand that God has already won victories many times over, then we can have faith that he can do it for us. This takes care of the doubt. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. The next important connection to another principle of building happy homes is love. When we take the word of God, the testimonies, victories past, and the loving relationship he offers, fear has to flee. Love conquers fear every time. So if you want trust in your home, you've got to get rid of the fear. you got to get rid of it. Some daily building blocks of trust. Make reading the Word of God out loud a daily habit in your home. R regularly share testimonies with each other about what God has done and is doing in each of your lives. Regularly review the elements of love and take inventory. Ask, are these things present in your relationship with each other and God? As long as there is love, fear has no place. Pray over each other against the spirit of deception. Pray that trust will take precedent when doubt tries to speak. I went through that one kind of quickly today. I guess because Amy was here, I felt motivated. Do we have any questions, comments, or concerns? Tyler, can you go dismantle the recording? I think what we're going to do next week is uh, reword everything. Rewrite it differently. 